Act Four of Paul Jones by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Berger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One, Achard's two rooms, separated by a partition. In the first, on the left, the entrance door in the back, a window on the left side, covered by a large curtain. In the middle, on the right, the door communicating between the two rooms. In the second room, a bed. In the back part, on the right-hand side, surrounded by green curtains. An ivory crucifix above the bolster of the bed. A table near the bedstead, close to the bolster. On it, a lighted candle, and the Bible on a small desk. On the same side, a window, a large armchair. Opposite, on the left side of the door, a wardrobe. Night achard in an armchair la feuille by his side do you wish for anything else mr achard nothing shall i send someone to attend you a priest there is none you know within two leagues except our chaplain in the chateau then leave me alone i thank you good-bye mr achard Farewell. Exit La Feuille. Achard alone. The priest and the physician are attending the Marquis. So heaven calls us before its throne on the same day that we may answer for our sins together. Heaven is just, but where is man's justice? To let me die without hell, without comfort. Could not a share fall to my lot? He, who fears death, why does he not keep the physician and send me the priest? I, who am weary of this life. But a priest, a priest, he would have heard my confession. I would have delivered those papers to him. And the marchioness... Oh, that woman renders my death as solitary and desperate as she has made my life. Oh, for a few words of prayer, of peace in my last hour. A voice of comfort would have made the flight of my soul from this world to another cheering. Throws his head back. Heaven wills it not. Let me resign myself. The will of heaven be done. Enter Paul, runs quickly to Achard. My father. Oh, is it thou? I did not hope for these joys. And could you suppose that the moment I heard of your sickness? But I did not know where to look for thee. Where send thee a message? I was at the chateau. I heard all and hastened to see you. But how is it you are left alone here, no attendant? They have kept the doctor from me. They refused to send me the priest. Let me get a horse, and in an hour... An hour hence will be too late. Too well, I feel, the physician can aid me no more. But a priest... Father, I cannot replace a priest's sacred mission. But I can talk to you of heaven, its greatness, its goodness yes but let us first have done with the things of this world that nothing may disturb our thoughts of heaven i hear the marquis is also dying so they say the moment he is dead you know the papers in this wardrobe are to be delivered to you you told me so if i die before him if i die without a priest to whom shall I entrust that sacred deposit? Shows him a key under his pillow. Take that key. It opens that wardrobe. You will there find a small box. You are a man of honour. Swear that thou wilt not open that box till after the death of the Marquis. I do solemnly swear. Heaven bless you. Now I can die in peace. You can die like an honest man. The son gives you his hand in this world. The father will welcome you in the next. 
thou trusty friend obedient to the living faithful to the dead would to heaven i had for once disobeyed him i might have prevented that duel i should not have been a witness tis this paul i would have said to the priest that fault weighs heavily on my conscience that solitary duel murder i should call it am i not a sharer in that crime no father i am ignorant whether the laws of what they call honor in this world stand fair in the eyes of heaven whether our religion forbidding crime permits a fellow creature seeking another's blood for vengeance sake or if the hand of heaven directs the pistol or the sword this i know not but i feel i should have acted in your place as you have done if i am wrong then do i share your error and more than any other man have a right to pardon you i in my name in the name of my dead father pardon you bless you my son for bringing comfort to a dying sinner horrid are the pangs of remorse they lead to doubts of heaven's power and who doubts that doubts punishment hear me ashard i also doubted i also was an unbeliever till reason shed its light upon me seek for heaven in the works of its creation then began my wanderings with an eternal secret between heaven the wide ocean and myself in the solitudes of that glorious new world roaming through wilds then perhaps for the first time pressed by human footsteps no roof but the blue canopy of heaven no resting place but the damp ground there i awoke there the all-powerful voice of nature spoke to me first in all her glory for a long time did i wander ere i understood that powerful language amid the living works of nature the limpid stream the wild cataract the forest tree the perfume of flowers and plants the mist vanished from my eyes the weight which oppressed my heart disappeared then i understood the universal homage all nature yields to her creator i looked towards the ocean and a brighter light a deeper conviction shone upon my mind earth is a limited sphere the ocean the immensity the most powerful the grandest of the works of god i heard it roaring as an angry lion he spoke and it crouched down as a dog before its master i saw it rise like the giants of old storming the heavens the tempest raged its furious waves struggled with the lightning to drown the thunder's roar then again bright and unruffled as a mirror reflecting the clear light of even the last star of heaven on earth i learned the existence of a creator on the ocean i beheld his power in solitude amid the tempest heard his voice then all doubts left me i became a christian i believed and prayed ashar kneels down his hands joined in prayer praying half loud father of heaven i believe in thee see father a priest would not have spoken to thee as i have done i speak to you as a rude sailor more used to words of death than comfort forgive me thou madest me believe and pray like thee what could a priest do more he goes towards his bed assisted by paul what thou hast told me is great and glorious let me think of it let me reflect on it lays down on his bed when i feel death approaching i will call thee paul closes the curtains on him rest easy i shall be here sits down on the chair at the foot of the bed for a moment absorbed in his thoughts suddenly a voice outdoors is heard margaret from outside paul paul quickly raising his head who calls me margaret outside but near the door paul paul running towards the door it is her voice he opens the door and finds margaret her hair dishevelled and sinking down what is the matter tell me margaret falling on her knees help help paul raising her what art thou afraid of who pursues thee why come at this hour oh 
I would have fled at any hour, by day or night, far as the earth would bear me, till I could find a bosom on which to shed my tears, an arm to protect me. I would have fled. Paul, Paul! Throwing herself in his arms. My father is dead. Poor child! Thou hast fled from the house of a dead man to enter one of a dying man. Death behind thee in thy dwelling. It meets thee again in the cottage. Yes, yes, but here an easy, quiet death. There, death in despair. Oh, Paul, if you knew what I have seen! Tell me all. You know the terrible effect your voice and presence had on my father. I do. He was carried speechless to his apartment. I spoke to your mother. He heard me. It is no fault of mine. I could not resist my anguish, even though sure to irritate my mother. I went upstairs. The door was shut. I knocked softly. I heard a feeble voice ask, Who was there? And your mother? My mother was gone. She had locked the door. But when he knew my voice, when I told him who I was, Margaret, his daughter, he told me to look for a private staircase, which leads to his chamber by a closet. An instant after, I was at his bedside. He gave me his blessing, a father's blessing. I trust God will give me his. Yes, quiet thyself. Weep for thy father, my child. But weep no longer for thyself, for thou art saved. That moment, Paul, when I was kneeling down, kissing his hands, that moment I heard my mother's footsteps. She came by the private staircase. I knew her voice. So did my father. He embraced me, for the last time, and made me a sign to hasten away. I obeyed, but I was so bewildered, so agitated, I mistook the door, and instead of taking the staircase by which I came, I entered a closet having no passage out. My mother entered, with a priest. Oh, she was paler than a dying man himself. Great God! The priest sat down, near the pillar. My mother remained standing, at the foot of the bed. Paul, do you hear? I was there. I cannot escape. A daughter forced to hear her father's confession. Is it not horrible? I sat not. I fell on my knees. I shut my eyes that I might not see. I prayed that I might not hear. Yet against my will, I saw, I heard, and what I heard, for ever will remain impressed upon my memory. I heard my father speak of broken vows. Adieu, Bada! And at each word, my mother's cheek grew paler. Raising her voice to drown his dying words, she cried, Believe him not, holy father. He is mad, he is insane. Believe him not. Poor, what a horrid sight. Sacrilegious, unholy. A cold dew came upon my brow. I fainted. Heavenly justice. When I recovered, all around was silent as the grave. My mother and the priest were gone. I looked upon the bed and saw beneath a sheet a corpse. All was over. An icy fear, unconquerable, mortal, forced me from the room. I fled downstairs, I know not how. I passed through doors, passages. At last, the cool air told me I was outside the house. I recollected you had told me I should find you here, and I rushed madly on. I fancied I beheld shadows, spectres pursue me. Turning an alley, or was I mad? I thought I saw my mother in her mourning robes. T'was then you heard my cries. A few steps more, and I fell down before this door. Had it not opened, I had died, for I was distracted, and I thought... Listen. Hark! Going nearer to Paul. I hear footsteps. The door in the centre opens. The marchioness appears. Margaret, hiding herself behind the window curtains, and covering Paul also with the window curtains. Look, look! Enter Marchioness. The stage is dark. Marchioness enters slowly, shuts the door after her, locks it, and without seeing Paul and Margaret, goes through the first chamber, enters the second, and sits down near the foot of Ashar's bed. Ashar opens a side of the curtains. Who is there? Marchioness opens the other curtains. It is I. You? What do you want near the bed of a dying man? I come to offer thee a proposal. To lose my soul, is it not? No, to save it. 
asha thou askest nothing in this world but a priest is it not so you refused me your chaplain he will be here in five minutes if thou wishest it let him come but make haste but if i procure thee the peace of heaven wilt thou procure for me peace in this world say what can i do for you dying thou wouldst have a priest living thou knowest what i would have of thee you would shut the gates of heaven to me by a perjury i'll open them to you by a pardon that pardon is already granted to me and by whom the only one who had a right to grant it Marchioness, ironically has morley come back from heaven no but he left a son on earth and didst thou also see him again yes and didst thou tell him all all and the papers the documents of his birth the marquis was not dead the papers are here asha falls on her knees asha have pity on me you kneeling before me madam yes old man yes i am kneeling to thee i supplicate i implore thee thou holdest in thy dying hands my honour the honour of one of the noblest the oldest families of france my past my future life those papers oh they are my life or death more my name my reputation that of my children well dost thou know what i have suffered to bear that name spotless didst thou believe that my heart was not that of a mortal did not contain the feelings of a loving woman a wife a mother i smothered them all one after the other that strife was a long one for during twenty years it lasted margaret in the next room what does she say oh heaven here heaven wills that all shall come to the light of day madam you doubted heaven's goodness you forgot he pardoned the adulterers yes he did but not man they were they not about to immolate her ere he came and men who for twenty generations were wont to respect my name to honour our family would now despise me cover me with shame ah my god rises my god i have suffered such bitter pangs thou wilt pardon me in thy mercy and am i alone exposed to the railings of the world will not my two children bear the same disgrace is not the other the first-born he is my child well do i know it so is emmanuel so is margaret but have i a right to force them to call him brother hast thou forgotten he is the son of the marquis doré by right of law the head of our family dost thou forget that he is master of our titles of our fortune let him invoke that law and what remains to emmanuel the templar's maltese cross to margaret a convent margaret aside yes yes a convent a convent where i may pray for you my mother silence oh madam you know him not his noble nature no but i know the human heart he can recover a name a fortune who has neither and canst thou believe he would give up that fortune that name yes he will only ask him to do so and what right have i to ask that sacrifice of him what right to beg of him to spare me emmanuel margaret he will say madame i know you not i never saw you who are you Ashar, growing fainter in his name madam in his name i engage i swear marchioness bending over him and watching the progress of his death 
thou engagest thou swearest and on thy bare word thou wouldst have me risk the years that i may live against the few minutes left thee to die i have begged of thee i have implored thee for the last time yet do i once more beg thee implore thee to restore those papers they are not mine they're his marchioness with energy i must have them i tell thee O oh, merciful heaven nobody is near thee we are alone that key sayst thou never quits thee would you tear it from a dying man marchioness with a smothered voice and falling down on the chair no i shall wait Ashar rising on his seat let me die in peace leave me taking the crucifix leave me in the name of heaven he falls back on his bed dying marchioness bending down under the crucifix oh she shuts the bed curtains oh horror horror on your knees margaret marchioness passing her arm between the closed curtains tears the key from ashar's hands rises goes towards the wardrobe looking at the bed in terror paul meets her halfway and when she is about opening the wardrobe with the key he takes her by the arm she cries out ah. give me that key mother the marquis is dead those papers are mine now marchioness moves back in astonishment sinks in the armchair heavenly justice it is my son margaret on her knees in the other room raising her hands to heaven gracious heaven it is my brother End of Act Four Act Five of Paul Jones by Alexandre Dumas Translated by William Berger This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Act Five, Scene One Same decoration as in the third act. Chandeliers lighted and the candles nearly burnt down a fire in the chimney a table with paper writing materials etc marchioness alone her arm resting on the table her eyes fixed on the contract where lecture had signed his name already and the marquis partly his she rings the bell on the table a servant appears in the door tell miss dore i wish to see her exit servant the marchioness returns melancholy and immovable to her first position what a night and after all the strife is not yet over that the dead should leave an heir to his secret my son that name which fills the heart of a mother with joy makes me shudder yes there is no other help rings the bell enter la Feuille. call count emmanuel he went out at ten o'clock this morning with baron de lecteur gone out i saw him get into the carriage call his servant he went with him in whose carriage the baron's let my own be got ready immediately and call my daughter exit la Feuille. let her but sign this contract let her but quit me and go to town with her brother they must remain in ignorance of all then shall i be left alone i will call him i will offer him my whole fortune in exchange for those papers and can money or pity move his heart then may i hope that fatal secret will be buried forever in those gloomy walls oh could they but speak what horrid tales would they relate enter margaret her entry makes the marchioness raise her head margaret stretches out her hand to her mother madam approach why are you so pale why do you tremble margaret hesitating my father's death so sudden so unexpected i suffered much last night marchioness with a smothered voice yes yes 
the young tree bows down before the wind and becomes leafless the old oak resists the fury of the tempest i also margaret have suffered i too passed a terrible night and yet you see me calm composed heaven gave you a strong stern soul madam do not ask the same fortitude and sternness of others you would crush them i ask nothing from you but obedience margaret the marquis is dead emmanuel is now the head of our family i want you instantly to leave home for town with him i go to rennes and why because the chapel of our chateau is too small to see at one and the same time the betrothal of the daughter and the funeral of the father mother piety and respect for my poor departed parent should at least let a longer interval take place between two ceremonies so opposite true piety is obedience to the last will of the deceased look at this contract see the first letters of your father's name oh i ask of you when my father traced those letters which death interrupted was he in sound mind did he act from his own free will i do not know but what i do know is that the influence under which he acted survives him parents as long as they exist represent heaven on earth heaven commanded terrible things to me and i obeyed act like me obey mother three days ago tears in my eyes despair in my heart i rushed from before my brother to the feet of that man from that man to my father no one would listen to me no one could understand me cold ambition or madness drowned my voice now here am i face to face with you mother you the last to whom i once more address my prayers you too should understand me better than any other therefore hear me had i only to sacrifice my will to your happiness willingly would i make that sacrifice my love only also that but shall i sacrifice my son my child oh no you are a mother a mother's heart beats in your breast and i also madam i am a mother 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 yes to your disgrace call it so madam if you will still i am a mother i feel as a mother that holy feeling is all-powerful well tell me then you must understand these things better than i do heaven instilled a feeling in the heart of our parents a powerful feeling which speaks loudly and our children have they none whom obey if the voice of parent and child disagree never never will you hear the voice of your child for never shall you behold him again never see my child again and who can answer for that forever will his birth remain a mystery to him and if he learns it one day if he calls me to account such things may happen madam and knowing all this do you still persist in my signing that fatal contract marchioness after a moment's silence sign the contract margaret pausing but if my husband ever discovers the existence of that child if he calls the father of that child to account the shame cast in his name his honour if in a deadly conflict a solitary and lonely duel he kills the lover if his conscience reproach him for that murder poignant remorse torments him if he hears a voice from the grave call him assassin and if that husband then become mad marchioness frightened and agitated no more silence then you would let me be shut up with a maniac so that i may keep my name and that of my other children spotless you would then let every living being keep away from me from him my heart becomes iron that i should not feel my eyes are marble that i should not weep and wear a widow's garb a widow's mourning before my husband's death you would have my hair turn grey twenty years before the time silence silence then you would so that horrid secret should die with its keeper i should forbid the physician and the priest to approach their dying beds that i should in despair in agony go myself to close not the eyes but the mouth of the dying smother their last breath marchioness in despair and wildly silence in the name of heaven silence 
shall i sign the contract now my mother and all that will come to pass the malediction of heaven will be completed the crimes of the parents will be punished in their children until the third and fourth generation oh heaven am i not humbled now am i not punished enough margaret falling on her knees before the marchioness pardon me pardon me madam pardon me mother marchioness rising yes pardon ask pardon unnatural child thou who callest vengeance on thy mother child that strikest thy mother pity mercy i know not what i said mother you had driven me to distraction i was insane marchioness raising her hands over the head of her daughter oh heaven thou hast heard the words of my child never can i forget them can thy goodness forgive them ere i punish witness thou that i will spare her my malediction advances in order to go away margaret taking hold of her robe falls on her knees crying out mother mother pity mercy oh mother marchioness turns towards her daughter looks at her with a terrible look pushes her back and exit on the right side margaret falling down and crying out oh fainting enter paul by the centre door paul taking his sister in his arms and raising her margaret sister i am here thy brother margaret recovering who calls me paul oh thou alone paul my guardian angel sent by heaven rises assisted by paul that contract there your fainting explains all it is time to put an end to all these horrors and to see the marchioness at once margaret tell your mother that captain paul is awaiting her orders i go must i not also implore her pardon paul conducts her to the door on the right hand exit margaret i can well explain the feelings of the marchioness twenty years silence solitude anguish rendered of no avail to her her secret revealed she knows not how to one who ought to have been the very last person from whom above all else she would have hidden it enter emmanuel through the back door two pistols in his hands paul salutes him with a kind and fraternal expression emmanuel returns his salute proudly emmanuel places the pistols on the table and steps at some distance from paul i was looking for you sir although i hardly knew where to find you for like an evil genius you possess the gift of being everywhere and nowhere a servant at last told me he saw you enter the chateau i am much obliged to you sir you have saved me the trouble this time to seek you farther i am happy then that my own wish to see you sir though from a different motive met yours this time here i am what is your pleasure can you not guess sir i am astonished then little do you know the duties of a gentleman a soldier and you heap insult on insult paul calmly believe me emmanuel emmanuel haughtily yesterday i was count emmanuel to-day my name is marquis dore do not forget it sir paul smiling i say then that you know but little of the feelings of a gentleman if you suppose that i would let any one but myself settle the affair which was one of your own provocation yes sir you you threw yourself in my way not i in yours paul smiling the marquis dore forgets his visit on board my ship enough of that sir come we to the point yesterday i do not know from what strange and inexplicable sentiment when i offered you but not only a gentleman an officer nay any brave man accepts instantly without a minute's hesitation i say sir you declined a meeting and shifting your provocation you quarrelled with another not exactly a stranger to our dispute but one whom delicacy should have taught you to respect paul carelessly believe me sir i only obeyed a duty which left me no choice you offered to fight me i could not accept your offer and any other was indifferent to me i am too much used to fighting sir 
to fights terrible and deadly, to view such an encounter in any other light than as one of those daily accidents of my profession. Remember, sir, this duel was not of my seeking. You proposed it, and as I could not fight you, I accepted Baron de Lactor, as I would any other substitute, and, had I absolutely to kill somebody, I preferred that it might be a puppy, a useless, insolent coxcomb, rather than a brave and honest gentleman who would have considered himself disgraced, even should he only dream of accepting that infamous bargain which Baron de Lactor seriously proposed to you. Well, I met him. No blood was shed. I disarmed him twice, and might have killed him. I spared his life. Ask nothing more, seek no other explanation, for upon my honour I cannot give you any. Emmanuel impatiently. And you did really believe that mock fight would satisfy me, because I did not prevent it? Did you think that cloak would save you from my anger? No, sir, enough of your whims. We live in a world, not of fiction, but of reality. Your presence in this house has been fatal enough in reality, surrounded with no more romance. Lusignan has returned, in spite of His Majesty's order of exile. My sister, for the first time, refuses to obey her mother. My father killed by seeing you. Those misfortunes all are your work. Your presence converted this house into one of woe, of misery, and you must answer to me for all the evils you have done. Therefore, sir, speak to me as man to man, in open daylight, face to face. Speak to me, sir. See, I am as calm as you are. If you have anything of importance to disclose, tell me so. I will hear you. Paul, calmly. The secret you want to know is not mine. Believe me, sir. Insist no longer. Farewell. Emmanuel, rushing towards the door and barring the passage. Oh! Ye do not leave me, sir. We are alone here in this chamber. I did not bid you come. You came at your own pleasure. Now hear me. You have insulted me. You owe me satisfaction. Fight you must, and you must fight me. You are mad, sir. I have told you already. It is impossible. Then let me... Emmanuel, taking a pistol. Take care. Take care. Paul goes towards the chimney. Sir, vainly did I address you as a gentleman. I might not treat you as a villain. You came to us, strangers to you. Why and how I know not. If you came not to steal our money, our jewels, you came to steal a daughter's duty to her mother, a friend's sacred promise to a friend. In either case, you are a villain, who lays hand on a treasure. My honour, the most precious of all. Do not provoke me. Do not insult me. I will hear no more. Take that pistol. He throws a pistol at Paul's feet. Defend yourself. He takes the other pistol. Paul, without changing his position. You may kill me, sir, if you choose, though I hope heaven will not permit so great a crime. But you cannot force me to fight you. I told you so. I tell you so again. Take up that pistol, sir. Take it up, I tell you. Defend yourself. Paul, without answering, shrugs his shoulders and pushes the pistol back with his foot, Emmanuel continuing exasperated. Well, then, if you will not defend yourself like a man, die like a dog. Raises the pistol towards Paul's breast. Enter Margaret. Margaret cries out, rushes towards Emmanuel. At the same time, his pistol is fired, but the ball's direction is changed by the position of Margaret, passes above Paul's head, and strikes the looking-glass over the chimney. Margaret, rushing towards Paul and pressing him in her arms. My brother! My brother! Are you hurt? Emmanuel lets his pistol fall. Your brother! Your brother! Well, Emmanuel, do you understand now why I would not fight you? The door in the centre opens. The Marchioness, pale, enters, stops in the door, raises her eyes to heaven. Emmanuel and Margaret throw themselves at her feet, each holding one of her hands and covering it with tears and kisses. Marchioness, after a moment's silence, I thank you, my children. Now leave me alone with that young man. Emmanuel and Margaret rise, bow with respect, and exeunt. Marchioness locks the door after her children are gone, 
walks a few steps in the chamber then without looking at paul goes towards the table on which the contract is lying and leans on the back of the armchair before the table her eyes bend to the ground you wish to see me sir here i am you wish to speak to me i am ready to hear you paul with an accent full of tears yes madam yes i wish to speak to you since that wish was mine for the first time it has not left my heart i did remember a woman as a dream long long ago gliding to my cradle in my infant dreams i took her for the guardian angel of my childhood since that time still so fresh in my memory more than once madam believe me i awoke starting as if i felt a mother's kiss imprinted on my cheek then perceiving no one near me i called that woman believing she was gone out only and that my voice would recall her for twenty years madam have i called her and now for the first time she answers at my call is it true often have i shuddered at the thought that you were afraid to see me is it true alas i am afraid this moment have you nothing to say to me marchioness with a suffocated voice and if i was afraid to see you come back was i in the wrong only yesterday i perceived you for a moment and that terrible secret which until now was unknown to any but heaven and myself is known to my two children is it my fault if heaven undertook the mission to reveal it was it i who conducted margaret despairing and trembling to her dying father to implore his aid and made her an unwilling witness to his dying confession did i bring her to a shard's was it not you madam who followed her hither as for emmanuel the report of the pistol you heard that broken glass do they not bear witness that i preferred to die rather than save my life at the risk of your secret no no madam believe me i am the instrument only not the arm no madam heaven alone directed all for the best in his almighty providence that your two children so long banished from your embraces might throw themselves at your feet marchioness hesitating but there is a third what may i hope what may i fear from him let him accomplish a last duty madam that done he will kneel before you and ask for your commands and what is that duty to restore his brother to that rank to which he is entitled his sister that happiness which he has lost his mother that peace of mind that tranquillity which he implores and cannot find and for all that the minister thanks to you refuses to baron de lecture the regiment which he had promised him for my son paul taking a commission from his pocket because the king has already granted it to me for my brother marchioness looks at the commission then you would give margaret to a man without a name a fortune and more an exile a proscribed you are mistaken madam i wish to unite margaret to the man she loves i wish to give margaret not to lusignan the exile but to baron anatoly de lusignan his majesty's governor-general for the island of guadalupe who is waiting for his wife on board my ship there is his commission take them both madam and deliver them yourself to your children marchioness looks at the parchments and receives them from paul yes i confess this satisfies emmanuel's ambition makes margaret happy and restores you to peace to comfort madam for emmanuel and margaret leave to-night she to join her husband he his regiment and you will remain alone in this old castle which you have longed to have so often am i right madam or am i mistaken but how to break off with baron de lecture the marquis is dead madam is it not a sufficient cause to postpone a marriage when a husband a father is dead marchioness looks at him a moment sits down writes a few lines and rings for a servant enter servant this letter two hours hence to baron de lecture servant takes the letter bows and exits now sir as you have done justice to the innocent now have pity on the guilty 
you have those papers which affirm your birth you are the eldest at least the law gives you that privilege you are entitled to the name to the fortune of emmanuel and margaret what do you ask in exchange for those papers paul takes the papers out of his pocket permit me only once to call you mother call me your son your son once only marchioness rising is it possible you talk of rank of name of fortune is my name not known have i not acquired a rank which few men of my age possess i have a name the name of paul jones blessed by a free people the terror of her enemies am i not the adopted child of a great nation did not the immortal washington call me the champion of liberty is not my name blessed by millions of happy freemen wealth riches what have i to do with them i might acquire wealth enough to be a king to leave an emperor's fortune behind me are not the thanks is not the gratitude of america worth all the paltry honors the baubles a king could bestow on me what have i to do then with your name your rank your fortune have you nothing else to offer nothing else to bribe me with oh give me restore me what i never had what i have missed everywhere give me what i cannot rustle for give me what god gave me what misfortune took from me what you alone can restore to me you alone oh give me a mother oh let me call you mother call me son marchioness moved to tears my son my son my son paul goes quickly to the chimney throws the papers in the fire throws himself at the feet of the marchioness who has fallen back on her chair my mother ah oh, at last that name that sweet sound from your lips from your heart so long have i asked waited prayed for it thanks oh heaven thanks hides his head in the bosom of the marchioness marchioness raises his head looks at him oh look at me let me weep a mother's tears of joy twenty long years have my eyes been dry these are my first tears give me thy hand she places it on her heart twenty years have passed and this is the first joyful feeling the first delight my heart has known come to my arms the first embrace the first kiss kisses him from my child for twenty years merciful father i thank thee the sinner is pardoned thou hast restored tears to my eyes joy to my heart thou hast restored me the embraces of my child thanks o oh, heaven thanks o oh, my son kissing him mother and i was afraid to see thee again i trembled when i did see thee again i did not know i did not know what feelings lay dormant in my own heart oh oh bless thee bless thee i bless thee at this moment the bell of the chapel strikes a signal gun is heard paul kneels again my son what wouldst thou did you not hear mother a second signal gun is heard two signal guns one more and i must haste away on board third signal gun is heard then thou wilt quit me already this very night must i depart blessed be the son who after twenty years of sorrow of anguish has restored peace to his poor mother's mind may heaven pour his blessings on thy devoted head for ever and ever we shall never meet again in this world but i shall hear of thee shall i not and when that name strikes my ear the name of paul jones when a great nation pronounces it with veneration then will i kneel and pour a mother's blessing before the throne of grace bless thee my child my son farewell farewell paul rising farewell mother bless thee farewell 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 
farewell mother farewell farewell i leave thee mother thy son has done his duty now to my adopted country glorious america farewell farewell exit paul hurriedly marchioness looks round her gone then i am left alone let me pray for him on his father's grave end of act five end of paul jones by alexandre dumas translated by william berger